So the reality of this unit is there isn't really a broad trends because we're primarily only caring about or dealing with the foreign policy. Now, we do get a little bit domestic, especially for 1920s culture, but most of this is built upon what is foreign policy and imperialism like for America during the turn of the century. So I will give you some broad trends to look forward to, and that is, are we being imperialistic? And we're going to see America step out of its more traditional setting of just kind of sticking with ourselves and, you know, dabbling here and there. We're going to start actually becoming players and swinging our weight around a little bit, especially in the area surrounding us. But we're also going to see World War I, and America is going to get involved in European affairs for arguably the first time. And so watch this trend. We're going from the Monroe Doctrine to all of a sudden leaving the Monroe Doctrine, and there are lots of steps in between. So watch that kind of transition over time. Some things to keep in mind is going to be how the culture plays an impact on it. We want to look at the justifications that America is giving for being imperialistic. This is very similar to Manifest Destiny, where how do we justify doing stuff like taking other people's land? And we're going to see justifications hinge tremendously on racism slash social Darwinism. Pay attention to the idea of white man's burden, which is going to be that it is a challenge but a responsibility for white people to take care of, and I'll quote Roosevelt here, their little brown brothers um, who just, bless their hearts, couldn't civilize without us, um, which is tremendously condescending and also incredibly racist. Um, so keep an eye out for that as well. And then there's the good old fashioned, well, we do this for economic reasons and we want to make ourselves better off. So as we move into this unit, let's look at this essential question. What role should the U.S. play in political, social, and economic affairs of other countries? We're going to talk considerably about something called imperialism, so it's important for us to define this. So as you can see there, imperialism is a policy of extending a country's power and influence through diplomacy or military force, which, hmm... Did we see this in Manifest Destiny? So you see the question there, could westward expansion on the North American continent be considered imperialism, why or why not? So I want you to take a second and think about that. One of the things that I wanna emphasize in this unit is our focus on claims and supporting claims with evidence. So as you're thinking about this question, think about what specific pieces of evidence would you use to prove that? And it's important to kind of take a step back and go, all right, well, the question is asking if our manifest destiny is counting as imperialism. So we're trying to see if it defines or matches the definition of imperialism. So you wanna look for evidence that either proves that it does or proves that it doesn't. So pay attention to that definition as well. I do think there's a really solid argument to be made that given this definition of imperialism, manifest destiny and westward expansion absolutely are or is an example of imperialism. So then you have this next question, is there a reason why the term imperialism might not be used in the context of Manifest Destiny? And I mean, even when I taught you it, I didn't really bring up the idea of imperialism or that language. So why might that be the case? And it's important to keep in mind in this, what is the connotation behind imperialism? The connotation behind imperialism, especially today, is as a negative thing. Um, much like if you call someone a colonizer, you aren't being like, hey, you're really looking for new opportunities. And so it's important for us to keep in mind when we're using the term imperialist, we typically are using it to define people that we think did something that is negative. And typically the way we think about it is going into another country and exerting your force over them, much like the definition says. And that's literally exactly what Manifest Destiny is. But it's important to keep in mind the idea behind Manifest Destiny that we deserve it. It's easy for us looking back to go, well, America is continental the United States. Like, that just is what it is. We, we always would have got this. But other countries, well, that's a whole nother story. There's some interesting things to think about and why that might not be the case, especially when we look at the treatment of Native Americans. Another question for us today, how did settlement in the West following the Civil War influence the development of an American identity? So again, we have America and national identity, and it's important for us to keep in mind something that we're going to see at the tail end of today. And that's this idea of how does the frontier, right, that expanse westward, how does it help define who we think we are as Americans? So I want to start with this question here, uh, or prompt, I guess. I want you to describe how the average person views a cowboy. So if I was going to stop a random person on the street and give them a whiteboard 
and say, all right, draw a cowboy. What do you think they're going to include? Now, normally I actually have you draw out a cowboy here, but we obviously can't do that. Um, but then I try and guess what I think. And I think what most people would go with is Woody from Toy Story, right? That's kind of that quintessential image of a cowboy. And this may have been debunked a little bit. I know the Red Dead Redemption games have gotten very popular of late. Maybe that helps push the notion that cowboys aren't, you know, what we kind of think of as cowboys. Hopefully you break out of the Western um, movie genre as defining cowboys because that very much doesn't. The reality is cowboys are lots of different people. We typically think of them as, you know, this white person who I'm going to follow the laws and they're, you know, keep some sort of justice in this land, and eh, not really. Technically, cowboys were people who were herding cattle back and forth. Um, these people weren't super well off. They weren't running around doing the kind of vigilante justice that we think of in cowboys, uh, and they included people who were not white. So in this moving west, it's important for us to look at what different kinds of groups of people are moving west. Um, and one of those absolutely is cowboys. You obviously have people who are already here. You have Native Americans, uh, and you have people um, of, you know, Spanish and what we would now say is Mexican heritage, right? But um, that kind of mixing that happened when the Spanish came over, they're not part of Mexico anymore, right? Because we took that land away, but they're still there. And you are going to see an influx of people from uh, Asia and China in particular. The gold rush is going to be a huge factor in bringing immigrants out to the West. And this is branching out beyond just a group of, you know, the miners or the farmers that we would expect. These are people coming out who want to strike gold and make it rich. So in 1849, you do have the gold rush in California, and there are also other deposits as well, but we typically focus on the 1849. And there is going to be a rapid influx of Chinese immigrants. California is pretty close to Asia, and so, yeah, I mean, that kind of makes sense. And in classic American fashion, and I bring this up as we, you know, still hotly debate immigrant issues to this day, and we, as America, haven't quite figured out how we want to handle that, that is American history. We forever have struggled with immigration. Go back all the way to the Know Nothing Party, right? When you start to see immigrants come over and try and exert political power. Then you see the influx of Eastern European immigrants uh, that we just dealt with in the Gilded Age. And you see a lot of this a similar sentiment around that. And in the same time period, you're going to see the Chinese Exclusion Act, which excludes the Chinese. So the example of... Um, I think you saw this come up in the beginning of the Trump administration, and you might see a repeal of it at the beginning of the Biden administration, was the so uh, the quote-unquote Muslim ban, right? Well, you're banning people from Muslim-heavy countries. You're trying to ban Muslims, and that's a problem. Literally, we did, we did Chinese Exclusion Act. Like, literally, we did that. That was, that was the thing we did. It is the first major act to restrict immigration specifically on the basis of race and nationality. And it's not the last. Keep in mind as you keep moving forward, look for the quota system. We start establishing quotas of only this number of people can come from these specific parts of the world. The federal government also wants to put forth an effort to try and get people out into the West, specifically to live there and kind of like get it established. And so they use similar incentives to what we've seen in the past. And there's something called the Homestead Act. This is in 1862, so literally during the Civil War. And this is trying to focus on settlement in the Great Plains. They offer 160 acres of free land to any person or family who will cultivate it and take care of it for five years. So that means you got to build a house there. You got to grow stuff. You got to like help establish it. And there are obviously benefits to this. That is a great opportunity if you have nothing. And you are going to see a lot of, let's think what's going on in the, you know, the 1860s. When you see the ending of slavery with the 13th Amendment, you are going to see a very significant number of African Americans who have been freed go to the West to take part in this. They're called exodusters. Uh, exo as an exodus, right? They're fleeing the South. And then duster because, well, I mean, it's really dusty out there, right? I mean... They're living in houses built from dirt. So, yeah. The drawbacks, though, are 
holy crap, that's a really hard way to live. Um, this is kind of what you would start thinking about with like the Laura Ingor Wilder, uh, you know, kind of a saga. And yeah, like it, that would be a hard way to live. You also have the Moral Land Grant Act in 1862 as well. And this is land that is given so that states can establish or maintain agricultural and technical schools. There are tons of examples around this. If you pick most like state schools, they are Moral Land Grant Act schools. So we're talking like NC State and we're talking about other things in the Midwest that have that sort of ag slash technical school. We're also going to complete the Transcontinental Railroad. We'll do this uh, in 1869. So we've officially bridged both sides of America. And there are lots of consequences with that. Think about what we just talked about in the Gilded Age and the prevalence of railroads and how monopolies on that could lead to marginalization or a negative impact on smaller uh, people. And by smaller people, I mean not as wealthy, not big businesses, that sort of thing. It's important to keep in mind, this also is going to allow you to tie in all of those kind of more rural areas. You can have towns pop up around railroads and you can have people live within commuting distance of that town by a railroad stop. And that's how you can be, bring goods in and out. But of course, you are going to see us carving up the landscape in order to put down these railroad tracks. One of the main things that I'm going to end with here is the treatment of Native Americans. And you can assume, not well, and that's correct, we don't treat them well, um, but it's important for us to keep in mind that this is really a continuation of our policy towards Native Americans from literally the beginning of America. We had sent Native Americans out to the West initially because we didn't want them where we were. And we were like, well, go out there. And now we've gone, hmm, I also want this land. Now you also have Native American tribes in this area who maybe through some time had moved out there, but some were just native to that area and really hadn't interacted with America much at all. So politicians are going to try and use treaties to kind of bridge this relationship with Native Americans. Two big examples, the Treaty of Fort La Ramee and the Treaty of Fort Atkinson. So you can see in both of these, we're giving money, we're giving land, but the focus is we want to allow for development. We want to put those roads, we want to put those forts, we want the Transcontinental Railroad, we want these things to run through that area. And we're going to start to see the beginning of what will become known as the reservation system. Um, we're going to see that in a little bit uh, ahead of us, but this is kind of setting the groundwork for that. For those of you that don't know a reservation system, and we have reservations here in North Carolina, it's basically sovereign land that is given to those Native American tribes, and it is their sovereign land. And so the federal government can have some impact on their, um, like the FBI can go in to help with investigations, uh, but the local law enforcement of the area surrounding it don't have a say or in, in the jurisdiction of that sovereign land. That would be tribal uh, authorities who have control over that. And I also want to point out, while we talk about these treaties, there is going to be essentially constant warfare between Native Americans and Americans for a significant number of times. You see here the dates, 1868 to 1890. Sometimes these are called the Indian Wars, so you could also see that when you're studying. I'm going to hit some high and low points of this kind of dynamic between America and Native Americans and kind of talk about how each of them has an impact on what comes forward. There are obviously lots of other battles that happened and skirmishes that happened during this time. We're going to focus on just a couple of them. The first is the Sand Creek Massacre, and this is in 1864. This is frequently seen as kind of the jumping off point for a lot of the violent relationships uh, or clashes between America and Native American tribes. This is a surprise attack by U.S. troops on the Cheyenne, and this is during peace negotiations. So we are trying to negotiate peace with them and then lead a surprise attack on them. And they attempt to surrender, but we don't let them and we keep fighting. Uh, and we will kill over 200 tribe members. And this is including women and children. This is going to lead to, and you see the term here, plain wars. You'll also see that as well to kind of try and describe this time period. It's hard to blame Native Americans in general for watching like a tribe try and sit down and negotiate with America, America then attack them and literally massacre them. Do you want to point out, though, you also are going to see Native American tribes initiate conflict as well. It's not just going to be places where America itself attacks Native Americans. You'll also see attacks by the Native Americans. 
As you can see, the Fetterman Massacre would be an example of that as well. One of the more significant names is the Battle of Little Bighorn. Um, this is going to be also known as Custer's Last Stand. Um, so basically, there's reports of gold in Sioux territory, and you know Americans, we're all about some gold. I will tell you, remember Trail of Tears? That started out of discovering gold in Georgia. So we hear there's gold and we're like, sweet. Sitting Bull is the leader of the Sioux tribe, and there are some clashes leading up to this, but ultimately there is going to be the Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand, where the Sioux are going to kill literally all of those American soldiers, including Custer, his last stand. It's important to note the significance of the buffalo in this area. A lot of the Native American tribes, especially the ones that were native to this area, did use the buffalo as kind of the main sustenance for themselves. Um, and there was a significant amount of, you know, honoring of the buffalo by using all pieces of the buffalo. It's very much like the circle of life type idea, right? I'm getting life from this animal, so I should honor its life by making sure I don't waste it. Um, and so you're going to see, you know, the meat be eaten. You're going to see uh, bones being used for tools. You're going to see the skulls used for ceremonies, right? Lots of different ways that this animal is used. And so there is this kind of con conservation type approach to it of we want to honor this animal. And that is going to be how it kind of is for these Native American tribes for a long time. And as America goes out there, there's a problem. One, the buffaloes do make it difficult to have railroads because they can like just walk across the railroads. And I don't know if you've ever seen buffalo, but they're huge. And just casually hitting those with a train is not something that's super great. Uh, and so there is an emphasis on trying to not eliminate this, but really deal with this huge amount of buffalo. So part of it is, again, that railroad thing, but part of it is also America acknowledging, well, if the Native Americans are dependent upon it and we get rid of that, we can make them more dependent on us, which means we can kind of dictate what happens to them. So you'll see professional buffalo hunters who are out looking for hides, and they're not honoring the animal. They will frequently kill the animal and then strip the hide off of it in the field and then just kind of leave the carcass there and move on. So you kind of have this as like a middle finger to the Native Americans because this is quite literally the opposite of how they intended um, this dynamic between them and the animals to be. Railroad companies will hire sharpshooters to just literally try and kill them. Um, there's this fantastic image of just people hanging out of, you know, the windows and doors of a train shooting buffalo as they go by. That's purely to try and deal with the populations around those tracks. And you also see the U.S. Army encouraging this killing. And so I, it's really hard for us to, to fathom the sheer numbers involved here. And so I do have a couple images that I hope can try and paint a picture. In 1865, there are about 15 million buffalo. And about 20 years later, you have fewer than 1,000. So that's essentially 15 million buffalo killed. And I, it's just really, really hard for us to fathom. So if you look at this image here at the top, this is a guy standing on a pile of buffalo skulls. That's how high that pile is. Or the other picture, this is a guy sitting on piles of buffalo hide. We are talking tremendous numbers. Now there is going to be kind of an awakening of consciousness, we could say, in about the 1880s, where people, Americans, are saying, maybe we're not going about this in the right way. One of the main documents of this time period is A Century of Dishonor. This is by Helen Hunt Jackson. Very, very significant document. And it's important for us to keep in mind when this, because we talk about the idea of spectrums, right? So when we look back in history, we can talk about people who are calling out injustices they see at the time, especially things that we now would go, yeah, that's really wrong like the treatment of the Native Americans. But maybe those people calling out the injustice aren't as progressive as we will end up becoming in the future, right? That's this spectrum that we can see. So here's Helen Hunt Jackson, who is saying, this is really wrong. A century of dishonor, a hundred years of dishonor of treatment we've had towards the Native Americans. We need to change that. And some of the things she goes with are, we need to Christianize them, we need to turn them into productive farmers, and we need to integrate them as citizens or assimilation. It's one of those things where you're like, it's great that you're acknowledging there were problems in how we're treating Native Americans and we should change that. But the, the tactics she's going with are still similar to 
what we would say now as wrong, and it's a focus on assimilation. So assimilation is when you have a group come into a culture, and then the expectation is that the, from the dominant culture is that this group is going to become like them uh, instead of keeping their own customs or identities. And I don't have time to give you all the examples. I mean, look around right now if you want to see some of the clash between the idea of assimilation and groups that don't want to uh, have to become just like Americans for assimilation. Um, and there is definitely value in groups coming together and continuing to hold on to traditions and customs, right? Think about food. Food is one of those things where we're totally willing to allow a culture to have something and we're like, oh, that's delicious, let's do that. It's when they bring in their language, their religion, their dress, that's when we're like, mm, I don't know about this. So we can look at Helen Hunt Jackson and go, ah, oh, you're not going far enough, but it is important to point out, she's at least attempting, like there is something wrong with this. And that is something you'll see because there are hardliners who are focused on containment. Just bottle them up and keep them somewhere and just let us move on with our lives. And there are obviously problems with assimilation. One, Christian missionaries, some of them, or a lot of them, didn't respect the traditional culture. Um, one of the best examples of this is there were ghost dances. Um, and so these were designed by Native Americans to bring unity and hope. And Americans really didn't like it. We were like, mm, nah, that's not Christian. That's not right. Don't do it. And so we're telling them, hey, don't do these dances. And they're like, it's literally our culture. So like, I'm going to keep doing these dances. And this leads us to the Wounded Knee Massacre. And America gets fed up with these ghost dances. And so quite literally the American military is sent out. Sitting Bull is going to be killed and over 200 Lakota men, women, and children are going to be killed as well. And this is one of the like ending points of this whole dynamic. That's kind of the crushing blow on the Indian Wars or the Plains Wars. And you're going to see less violence from here on out, especially because there's going to be more of a heavy-handed focus on assimilation. The main focus of this is something called the Dawes Act or the Dawes Severalty Act. And essentially the focus on this is a focus on assimilation. And it's how can we encourage Native Americans to assimilate? This is moving against a reservation type policy where they're in control of themselves and it's trying to bring them into the folds of America. Remember though, we got to keep in mind this American national identity. We have things that we want them to change. They need to get rid of their tribes as legal entities. We want to wipe out tri tribal joint ownership of land. We're going to give individual family heads 160 acres of land uh, and they get full titleship of the own, like full ownership of that title of land uh, in 25 years if they behave. I do want to point out, what was the math for Americans? It was 160 and five. Okay, interesting. I'm just, interesting. Okay. And the leftover reservation land is going to be sold and that money will be used to educate and what we will call civilize Indians. And this is going to be something to keep in mind as we start focusing on imperialism over the next couple days. And that's going to be an attempt at civilizing these groups. We see this dynamic play out at the beginning of American colonization and it's, you don't look like us, you don't act like us, so that's something wrong, we're going to make you better which is tremendously condescending. One of the main things I wanna focus on with assimilation is going to be what becomes like the education of the children. So you can see with these pictures here, and you see this quote, kill the Indian, save the man. One of the main focuses of the Dawes Act is going to be to educate um, Native American children in more like white schools or what we would say is more American schools. And you can see in this picture Native American children, and then Native American children's through this assimilation. I'll mention a movie here. It's called Wind River, and it was on Netflix for a while. I don't know where it is. I haven't watched it recently, but I do recommend this movie. It is, it's a hard R, so I'll just acknowledge that up front. Um, but it does kind of show some of the dynamics of the modern reservation type system. Um, so basically, um, there's been a, a murder of one of the Native American uh, teenagers, Maybe she's like 16 or 18 or something like that. Um, and uh, FBI agents are helped to, they're allowed to be, come in to help kind of navigate the thing and try and investigate it. Um, and one of the actors, Jeremy Renner, um, is like a piece of him is part of the tribe, but he's uh, mostly white. And there is this uh, dynamic between the girl's father and him. And one scene stands out in particular to me, which is... Um, 
the, her father, who again has just lost his daughter, um, is sitting on like the, the back of his property and Jeremy Renner comes over to him and um, the guy is, you know, completely dressed head to toe in what we would say is like Native American garb. Right? And Jeremy Renner's like, what does this mean? Um, you know, what does it represent? And he was like, I don't know. And what he kind of talks about is with this stuff, and we see it with assimilation, what happened is children were basically taught to like push back against that culture, go do something else, become like Americans, that sort of thing. And the, the language, the customs, the culture, um, something that like grandparents as they died, you know, it, you start having children replace that and then you lose it. And then there was this whole generation gone and it was essentially like wiping out that entire culture. Um, and his point in that was like, this was something taken from me and I, like, I, I wasn't an active participant in it, right? I wasn't even alive for this. And that's one of the significant things that we want to keep in mind is we're looking at um, how we, and we call America a great melting pot, right? We're all coming together. How can we come together in a way that honors and allows people to continue in their cultural heritage um, instead of trying to force them to become just like someone else? What we're going to focus on for the live portion is going to be this closing of the frontier. Because what we've basically done now is we've got all of, you know, continental United States. It's over. We took it all. So what happens next? And that's what we're going to see moving forward. One, what does America do now? Because we, we always had this focus for a long time of getting more land to the West. And now that's over. What do we do? And we're going to see that bleed into imperialism.